Women of color who aspire to political office can take some inspiration and some advice from a new publication. It's called Profiles in Leadership, Women of Color Elected to Office in Massachusetts. It's a collaboration between the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy at UMass Boston and the Women's Pipeline for Change. To tell us about the project are the Center's director, Ann Bookman, and one of the women profiled, a former state representative and candidate for mayor of Boston, Charlotte Golar Ritchie. Thank you both very much for being with us. Good to be here, Chris. Thank you for having us. I want to start with Ann with the, with the overview because it, my, my first reaction uh, to this project was that I know all of the, well, not all of them, but a good many of these uh, elected officials that you're profiling, and it didn't seem unusual to me anymore. But then I saw that, you know, they're still disproportionately, uh, you know, represented. I mean, there, there are still all these other people who are just men, you know. Right. So unfortunately, we still have really severe underrepresentation of women of color. And that's part of the reason that we collaborated with the Women's Pipeline for Change to really try to highlight uh, the women who have served. But we're, we're telling two stories, really, I think, in this report, which is one, a story of underrepresentation, um, only 94 women in Massachusetts who are women of color ever elected to public office. So there's that story. And then the second story is one of the contributions of people like Charlotte and others in the book um, that you mentioned who have been outstanding public servants and have had a huge impact on public policy. And I think our feeling is that the Commonwealth would only be the stronger if we had more voices, like the voices of those women, um, at the table, in the state legislature, in the city councils, on the school committees, and so on. Sure, go ahead, Richie. I, um, in, in your case, you come from a political family. Um, I, I got to know you when you were working on the show, so I know you had an interest in the public sphere in some way, but how did you cross the line from that to say, I'm going to run for office? Well, I think that's a great question. I mean, I wish I had had this guide when I was um, thinking about uh, entering into um, the public realm in terms of elected office. But you know what I, I did? I had worked for a while as a production assistant for a program called Gavel to Gavel. And by doing that, I was able to see the proceedings of the House of Representatives and look at people and say, wow, who's debating there? And I saw a Gloria Fox. You know, I saw a Marjorie Claproot. I saw women standing up for the issues that they cared about. And that made me say, huh, I wonder if I could do that. I wonder what you need to know and what kind of experience, background, credentials you need to have to be able to enter the fray. And I think what we see with this guide is it becomes a tool. It's a, a form of support. It provides role models to prospective candidates for office, women who might have scratched, might be scratching their heads right now and saying, I wonder if I could do it. Uh, and uh, I, I look back to the first word of this title here, and I, I think of that John F. Kennedy book I grew up with as a kid, Profiles and Courage. There's a lot of courageous people in this book, too. Yes, I was struck over and over again, especially with the in-depth one-on-one -on -one interviews that we did with a lot of the women in the book about what a courageous step it was for them to step um, into the public realm. Many of them had jobs that actually were going to pay more than what they were going to get if they won. Um, many, many of them have family caregiving responsibilities. Many of them volunteer in their communities. Uh, they're very involved people. And so to take, make the decision to run for office is a big decision. Um, and I think we learn a lot from the, our summary of these interviews on what it actually took and some of the sacrifices uh, that were made. Sean, sure. what, what about uh, just having that critical mass of time to, to be an elected official to run? In, I mean, you, you're subtracting it from, from life at home. Men have been doing that for a long time and, you know, and it seemed normal, but uh, how different is it from women? Uh, I think it is different. It's going to be um, a sacrifice um, that you're going to make in terms of time spent with family. We know that. Time spent um, doing other kinds of things that you need to do to support your household. I mean, when I ran for office, I had two small kids. And while I had a very engaged husband and was, you know, was lucky to have a partner who um, was very like-minded and supported my, the work that I was doing, it's still a lot of the work of rearing children and everything does fall on the mom and, and, it, and it fell on me and I felt the pressure around that. Um, but I still, you know, I was lucky because I had the support system. Imagine if you're out there trying to do it by yourself. Um, also, it takes a, a hit on your personal finances, um, on family finances. Where are you going to get the money to um, 
be able to get your campaign office and to get those signs that you need and, and all of the things that you need to do um, to be able to run a viable campaign. And um, you know, too few of us have a ready war chest waiting. Um, so it, it is, um, you know, it, there are a lot of things to consider before you step out there. And what, what about that uh, difference uh, when, when it comes to raising money? Well, I, we were told by many of the women we interviewed that that was a major challenge. And what they said they really needed were, was to mobilize all the networks that they were a part of. Personal networks, family networks, professional networks, um, networks that they had from knowing other parents at their children's schools. And by mobilizing those networks, they were able to create, and Charlie should tell me if this rings true with your experience, but they were able to create um, you know, a, a campaign uh, fund and to be able to start to get out there and make signs and do canvassing and take out ads on TV. and. Uh, those things are expensive. So, I mean, it, it definitely was a challenge. But I think part of what we're trying to do in this guide is to say to women who haven't done this, there are women who have done this. There are women who can mentor you. There are experiences that you can draw on. Women of color have been very successful, the ones that have been elected in doing this. And so there are, there are support systems um, for doing this. Charlotte, of course, uh, in your case, uh, you had been state rep for a while. Uh, later on, you run for mayor. It's a citywide race, wide open field. And um, what did you learn from that quantum leap? So I had, there were a lot of things that happened in between. Um, so I benefited from the fact that I had served in a, a, you know, headed up a city agency. So I knew a lot about the city before I got out there. And... Um, I, I think I had, um, I was prepared at least for the um, physical effort that it was going to take to um, work my way from East Boston to West Roxbury, you know, to Hyde Park, to South Boston, or, you know, Dorchester, through a Dorchester and so on. So that wasn't surprising. And I had um, a lot of wonderful contacts around the city. But still, if you remember, um, you know, there was some criticism or concern around whether my ability to quickly ramp up and raise the money that I needed to build the organization that was needed and to hone that message that would resonate with the public. All of those are the things that someone who's going to run for office needs to think about. I think this guide, as Anne is saying, and it presents us with some really good news to celebrate that nearly a hundred women, women of color here in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, have run and succeeded in winning office but the news that is still concerning is that it's nearly 100, and that's all, and a whole lot of firsts, and still firsts that haven't been, that haven't, we haven't seen yet. So there's work to be, do, that we need to do there. You know, I want to say, Chris, um, Ann and I would want to mention that yeah, this mean, was a collaborative effort, and we were talking off camera a little bit about that, and so for the Center for Women in Politics and Public Policy at UMass Boston, I want to congratulate them. They've done a wonderful job with this. And then there's also the Women's Pipeline for Change. So and there are a lot of women who've been involved in that effort, um, working with Anne, like Cheryl Crawford and Joyce Ferry Bo Bowling and Suzanne Lee. And so we've got a wonderful collaborative there. And then on our side, Digma Scott, who is the chair of the advisory board and um, sort of her support system for that effort. It and finally, you've got an anniversary for a milestone coming up, right? We do. We have a 20th anniversary coming up. Uh, it's October 29th. We're going to be celebrating it at the new Edward M. Kennedy uh, Institute for the U.S. Senate. And we are going to, in a sense, take over the Senate floor for the afternoon. And we're going to have a dialogue on women's leadership from very diverse perspectives, um, talking about what have, how far have we come, the, the successes, as Charlotte was saying, and where do we need to go in the next 20 years and beyond. And we invite everyone to join us. Thank you both very much, Ann Bookman and Charlotte Gullar ritchie In a moment, opening doors to a better life with help from the Justice Resource Institute. But first, this message.